What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit that like button and let me know what you think of today's very interesting discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit the subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. I hope all of you had a very happy Thanksgiving. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into another very interesting organized crime topic. And over the last five days, it was reported that Joseph DiNapoli died at the age of 89. Obviously, today in the 2020s, we're coming to grips and not really coming to grips, but noticing that all the old school mob guys are dying off. Men that were born in the 30s, 40s, and 50s are meeting their maker and cashing in their chips. Joseph DiNapoli and his brothers are arguably some of the most underrated mobsters in the history of the Lucchese and Genovese crime families. We're going to talk about them today with a focus on Joseph DiNapoli. The story of the three DiNapoli brothers next on the sit down. Joseph DiNapoli was born July 12, 1935 in the Bronx, New York. According to the 1940 census, he was the oldest son of a person called Louis DiNapoli. Now, Louis DiNapoli was born in America, according to that census. However, DiNapoli's mother, Sophie, it was recorded that she was born in Italy. Now, according to that census as well, Joseph DiNapoli's father, Louis DiNapoli, owned a print shop. He was a proprietor of a print shop in and around the Bronx and possibly East Harlem. By 1945-ish, the DiNapolis actually moved to 98 Pleasant Avenue in East Harlem, just down the street from where Rayo's sits today. DiNapolis' brother Vincent was born in June of 1937, and his other brother Louis was born in December of 1938. Now, the DiNapoli brothers also had a sister called Roseanne, who was born sometime in the mid-1940s. Now, as I said, the DiNapolis moved to Pleasant Avenue, which during those times uh, was a haven for Italians. In fact, most of the Genovese and Lucchese crime family came up in and around that area of East Harlem. And when we talk about the DiNapolis, both of these families were represented by these brothers. Joseph would go into the Lucchese family. Louis and Vincent would be part of the Genovese family. But if you know anything about Pleasant Avenue and some of the stuff they were doing around that time involving narcotics, the Lucchese and Genovese worked in unison in that area. And when we look at Manhattan in general, it has always been dominated by the Genovese and Lucchese crime families. We hear the names Giganti. We hear the names Di Palermo. We hear the names wherever you look. Most of that governing body, at least coming up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, around East Harlem was Genovese and Lucchese territory. Now, as far as Joseph DiNapoli, he would begin moving narcotics, and these guys would quickly get in to criminality. Now, Vincent and Lewis would hang around people like Vincent Fish Cafaro and Fat Tony Salerno, who were based out of East Harlem. I want to talk first about Joseph DiNapoli. In the early 70s, he would be arrested for selling H. Alongside that indictment, it would include Carmine Mr. Gribbs, Tremonti, and Louis Fat Gigi in Glacy. As I said, all of these people were moving a lot of H around Pleasant Avenue. And if you know anything about Pleasant Avenue, we talked about this when we went over the Purple Gang. We've talked about this when we went over all sorts of people connected to Lucchese crime family, heavyweight, Gribbs, uh, Gribbs Tremonti. He was essentially um, the investor in Pleasant Avenue. All the people that worked under him, this is what made these people very rich. And at the time, the Pleasant Avenue corridor was essentially a haven for H in New York. These guys were um, 
fronting black gangs. These guys were fronting um, Spanish gangs. This was the early cartel in New York City in the 70s. Now, Tremonti ended up going to prison and died in 1978. However, I want to talk more about Joe DiNapoli's involvement in this uh, conspiracy. All sorts of people were arrested. Now, in 1972, in his original arrest, Joseph DiNapoli was arrested alongside Vincent Papa, who as well was a big H mover. And police would find approximately $967,450,000 in cash in a duffel bag in the vehicle. Now, Joseph DiNapoli was also mentioned uh, as a known H dealer alongside a person called Frank Butchie Puglis. These guys are moving heavy H in the area. I want to talk about the exact indictment. According to a person called Hen uh, Harry Paniarello, in June of 1971, Paniarello would accompany Frank Puglis to the resident of, residence of Genovese Patalano. Or sorry, Genevieve Patalano, who was Joseph DiNapoli's girlfriend. She lived in the area of 1908 Bronxdale Avenue in the Bronx. At that time, Butch Puglis would indicate that he was working with or for DiNapoli and that he had money to be delivered. He had decided, however, to not give Joseph DiNapoli all the money, but instead it hid some of his in a sock. DiNapoli would accept this money, some eight to ten thousand dollars, without counting it. Now, Puglis, who would go to jail in October of 1971, before he left, he turned over some of his narcotics business to Paniarello, and Puglis would tell Paniarello that he was leaving two kilos of H and some cash with them. It was agreed that he, alongside another individual, would be the sole contact with DiNapoli, paying DiNapoli $22,000 per kilo of H and taking it to a stash house which Paniarella would make future pickups and deliveries. So at that point in the early 70s, when Joseph DiNapoli is in his 40s, his first job is moving age and making a bunch of money. And we find that people like DiNapoli, this is their first foray into crime. They make a bunch of money. They go to prison, and then they take that money and invest it into more legit enterprises, which we'll get to. However, for this little stunt involving narcotics, it was also uncovered that during this time, uh, Joseph DiNapoli was a large jail uh, extortion artist. Uh, he was also convicted of tax evasion and narcotics and would be sentenced to 21 years in 1975. He would head off to federal prison. However, he wouldn't remain there that long. He would only serve about seven years and be released in 1982. There is one thing that I learned about Joseph DiNapoli in his life, in his adult life, in his nearly 40, 50 years of being connected to the mafia. Joseph DiNapoli was indicted a lot. And one of the issues we have seen with a lot of these old school mobsters, Carmen Persco comes to note, it's in their early life not being punished enough, and they go right back to doing what they're doing. In the end, Mr. DiNapoli was given 21 years and only served seven years. He goes right back to the streets and is indicted multiple times, which we'll get to. Now, in terms of his brothers, during his prison sentence, Lewis and Vincent DiNapoli were becoming heavyweights in the Genovese crime family. They were both inducted into that cohort in the 70s and would become extremely involved with various construction and labor racketeering rackets, including interests in multiple unions. According to what we know about Vincent DiNapoli, and I will do a separate video on him at some point, Vincent DiNapoli was involved in various businesses, including two drywall companies, one of which was called Inner City Drywall. And what Vincent DiNapoli did was he maintained various interests around New York in not only legit but illegitimate enterprises. And he had various construction developments around New York. This guy was making money hand over fist. He even was able to open a restaurant in the Bronx, which um, many people uh, came to on a daily basis and enjoyed his food. According to what we know about Vincent DiNapoli, he and other people, including Stephen Crea, started working with a group called the Southeast Bronx Community Organization, uh, which created housing complexes like the one you see. 
Now, what we would also learn about Vincent DiNapoli is one of the people involved with the SEBCO was a person called Louis Giganti, the brother of Vincent the Chin Giganti. And what Sebco did was they were an organization with DiNapoli and Giganti that was an organization that handled low-income housing in the Southeast Bronx, which was financed by HUD, the Housing and Urban Development League, which uh, is still a business associated with the government today. Now, drywall companies connected to DiNapoli were able to secure construction projects that were awarded to Sebco. By 1980, Vincent DiNapoli had secured more than $16 million worth of Sebco contracts and more than $60 million in municipal contracts with two drywall companies. Now, I also want to point out how rich Mr. DiNapoli was. He would gross millions of dollars enough at one point for Forbes magazine to put him on the list of one of the biggest and richest mobsters in the nation. Now, in 1988 alone, Vincent DiNapoli received $32 million in city contracts involving drywall. That's how rich this guy was. Vincent DiNapoli was hugely profitable and during the 80s was one of the biggest earners in the Genovese crime family. And alongside his brother, they were titans in the construction and drywall industry. However, in the late 80s, Vincent and Louis DiNapoli were indicted for labor racketeering. Louis was hit with 14 years. And unfortunately, Vincent DiNapoli's relationship with Vincent Fish Cafaro, seen on the left, would do him in. As we know, Cafaro would do in many people, but one of the people he would do in is his old pal, Vincent DiNapoli. DiNapoli was hit with five years in prison and released. In 1992, he would die in 2005. Now, the remaining brothers that were involved in the life and both in prison at the time, Louis and Joseph uh, DiNapoli, were just getting started. I want to get back to Joseph DiNapoli, who by the 80s and into the 90s was really becoming one of the more powerful people in the Lucchese family. He headed a crew out of the Bronx that included people like Philip D. Simone and Stephen Crea. And what the Denapolis did was they taught Crea how to become a construction tycoon just like they were. And the truth was, by this point, Denapoli was no longer involved in narcotics. He was now involved in much more legit enterprises, including construction, unions, um, and bookmaking and loan sharking, which if you know anything about the Bronx, these guys were heading large gambling organizations their entire careers. And that's the thing about being in the mob, not only involved with construction and unions, but you have a lot of good money coming in from loan sharking, extortion, and bookmaking. Now, in 1993, Dinopoli is hit yet again with loan sharking charges. While in prison on those charges, he and his brother, Louis Dinopoli, are hit with a fascinating scheme involving asbestos. And listen to this. Essentially, the scheme netted them millions of dollars in asbestos removal contracts intended for minority or female-owned firms. And according to the Daily News back in 1995 when they're indicted, the Dinapoli brothers hired multiple people, including... Peter Velasquez, who was a Latino from New Rochelle, Sterling Crockett, an African-American from Baysides, and Marguerite Trombetta, a woman from the Bronx, and listed them as owners and presidents of three firms. That said, in reality, though, the companies were run by the Dinopoli brothers. The firms shared offices, and the workers funneled money to one another. Now, the brothers also and their cohorts cooked the books to show they were paying large-scale wages when they were ripping off immigrant workers who spoke little English. So essentially, these guys were realizing that if they put in women and minorities into these funded construction companies, they could get all sorts of contracts. And in reality, those people probably had no idea they were even the heads of these companies, and they were just workers. and they were getting screwed and scammed. 
again, a smart scheme, but the feds are going to figure it out sooner rather than later. Uh, both of these individuals were hit with prison sentences. In fact, Joseph DiNapoli, seen on the right, would get three years. But again, three years. These guys can do three years standing on their head. Joseph DiNapoli was released in 1999. So remember, Joseph DiNapoli has been involved in all sorts of stuff, as asbestos scams, loan sharking, narcotics, and has only served about 10 years in prison. Now, again, that seems like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, Joseph DiNapoli Price never should have seen the light of day again, but he really didn't have to pay for much. He just kind of got slaps on the wrist, and he was running a very powerful crime family uh, uh, um, faction in the Bronx. Now, as of 2000, according to an indictment called the Lucchese Construction Group Indictment, which included Stephen Crea, Mr. DiNapoli was listed as a captain in charge of people like Mr. Crea. However, by 2003, DiNapoli was added to a ruling committee of the family by Vic Amuso, who was in prison. That committee included DiNapoli, Neil Miglior, and Matthew Madonna. By 2003, Mr. DiNapoli was listed as official consigliere of the family. Now, I do want to mention um, to me, I know, you know he hasn't exactly uh, said some um, – he said some weird things recently. However, I've always said that John Panisi has a terrific channel associated with most notably the Lucchese crime family. And he told a pretty interesting story. And he always referred to DiNapoli as kind of like an old man and, and was very steeped in the traditions of Cosa Nostra. For instance, Panisi claims that DiNapoli didn't recognize people made in prison bathrooms and said that we basically don't do that sort of thing in this family. Now, DiNapoli, um, however, would have to face uh, the sad truth. His brother, as I said, would die in 2005, and the indictments would continue for him. In 2007 and 2009, he is hit by both state and federal governments in large racketeering cases, one of which involved a group out of New Jersey called the New Jersey Lucchese Crew, headed by Ralphie Perna and his sons, Joseph and, and, and others. These guys were involved in a large-scale bookmaking case as well as loan sharking, including a point on wiretap where DiNapoli talks about Perna and those guys saying about their bookmaking operation, quote, I got 25% of this thing, me and Maddie, referring to uh, DiNapoli and Maddie Madonna. And what the feds do is they paint Madonna and DiNapoli as essentially on the street, the heads of this family. And anybody doing business in Staten Island, New Jersey, they're connected with them. Everything floats up and they're involved with everything. They're getting pieces of all this and they're on the hook for this. This is how the mob works. And this is why when you are in high ranking positions, you have to deal with that little old word called Rico, which everything below you flows up to you and you're on the hook for things that maybe you're not even profiting off of or making a very small amount with. That said, Joseph DiNapoli is not making little money. Keep in mind, these, is, these are bookmaking rings that are netting tens of millions of dollars, and he's on the hook for 25%. Joseph DiNapoli and his brothers were very rich people. They, they made tons of money, and their families will never probably have to work again, even in legit businesses. That said, the feds just continue to come down and down on DiNapoli. He would serve time concurrently in both the state and feds. But if I told you his prison sentence came at the right time, would you believe me? It absolutely does. While serving time in prison on those state and federal charges involving bookmaking and loan sharking, Joseph DiNapoli is indicted again. Here he can be seen looking quite old and indicted in 2017. And guess who is indicted alongside with him? Stephen Crea, Matthew Madonna. And this goes back involving one of the main points of contention, according to the federal government, the murder of Michael Meldish, which I talked about here. And basically, all the people involved in the hierarchy of this family, Stephen Crea, Matthew Madonna, all of these people, even though they did not participate in the actual whacking of Meldish, 
the feds believe that all these people gave the okay to whack Meldish. And that's why Stephen Crea and Matthew Madonna are serving life in prison. That said, Mr. DiNapoli, who would have been on the street at this time, he was in prison. So he can't be involved, basically. If he'd have been on the street, he would be doing life. In fact, when he died last week, it would have been in federal prison, not at his own house. In the end, in this case, Joseph DiNapoli is hit with 52 months. He would be released from federal prison in January of 2023. So in the end, going to prison actually helped out DiNapoli in this case because if he'd have been on the street, he probably would have been involved in okaying all of this because everybody flowed up and he'd have been on the hook for taking part in whacking Mr. Meldish, even though he's in his 80s and had nothing to do with it. He was on the uh, governing body and on the level of consigliere. However, by 2020, he was actually taken down and um, just due to the fact that he was in prison, they went with younger leadership. As I said, DiNapoli was released from the feds in January of 2023. He would return to his home in Scarsdale, New York, and died last week at the age of 89 on November 25th, 2024, according to an obituary that can be found on the internet. He will have a funeral service in the coming days, as far as I know, out of Balsamo in the Bronx. So in the end, only one brother remains, Louis DiNapoli. He is still alive, as far as I know. Uh, he is the youngest of these three and ended up, like we would think, uh, being the only one still alive. As I've said, though, the families of these people uh, will likely have to work very little for the rest of their lives. All of the people I just mentioned, including Lewis and Joseph DiNapoli, uh, who survived in their 80s, have huge real estate portfolios. I know because I looked them up. Um, they still have various companies. DiNapoli, Joseph has various construction companies still in his name. Um, all of this will go to his heirs, his family. And like I, for instance, know his brother Lewis lives in a huge home in Scarsdale. Uh, these guys, uh, Joseph DiNapoli had a beautiful home at one point in Cape Coral, Florida. Um, I believe at one point owned a home in Maine. I, uh, I believe Kenny Bunkport. These guys had a bunch of real estate, a bunch of properties, um, you know, land, all sorts of stuff. And their families will likely never have to live in squalor. They'll live in luxury their entire lives. And these guys were extremely underrated. Uh, we don't hear much when it comes to the Dinopoli brothers, but whether it was the Genovese or Lucchese crime families, these guys were powerful. Um, they were recognized as high-ranking people, including Vincent, who you know had the ear of Chin Giganti and people like that. I know he moved around with Sammy Gravano and the Gambino crime family. And Lewis and Joseph were high members in their own right. Lewis was only a soldier, but Joseph ended up becoming a, a captain and then ultimately consigliere of the Lucchese crime family. As I end this video, I think the one issue that I always saw with the Lucchese family is the government did a good job of prosecuting quality leadership. Tony Ducks, Neil Miglior, Paul Vario, and Joseph DiNapoli. All of these people probably should have been the boss. Instead, though, Vic Amuso and Anthony Casso were the only ones on the street. And what they did in turn was drive this family into the ground. And that was the issue with the Lucchese's. All the high quality older folks that should have been boss, like the Migliors or like the uh, Joe DiNapoli, were constantly ducking indictments and in prison. And it led to the Casso Musa, uh, Musa regime, which was extremely violent and brought the family down. Joe DiNapoli dead at the age of 89. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of DiNapoli's in the comment section below. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.